Thank you for organizing uh, inviting me to give a talk here. It's my great pleasure. So uh, today I will talk about uh, real zeros of fixed polynomials and something called positive definite characters. Um, so it's a result actually already been announced two years ago, I guess, by sound as uh, I see on top, but uh, we, we still are in the progress of writing it up. So hopefully it will be on archive in two months. Um, so the result is uh, a correction in analytic number theory, um, but it has some strong probabilistic flavor. Um, I hope you uh, enjoy it. Um, at least it's easy to state this correction and, uh, and it's a very natural and beautiful correction. So I will first talk to you about these two things. So there's uh, two stories about being positive and then uh, after introducing the background and uh, why they are connected, I want to first uh, uh, guide you to give, make a guess why, uh, what could be the correct answer for the questions. And then in the third part of the talk, I will start to introduce the result we can prove, and then maybe tell you the connection to this thing called Fedora Harry Kitting conjecture. And uh, this FHK conjecture, it's basically more or less solved now. And um, um, it's also a problem somehow connects probability theory and the number theory. And uh, Max Rabbs, to where he gave a talk in this number theory web seminar before. And then I will give you like a couple, oh, in the rest couple of minutes, I will give you um, religious corrections. Um, Okay, so this talk is uh, based on the work in progress with uh, our advisor Sound and, uh, Rod and Rodrigo is another student of Sound. Okay, so let me first remind you the definition of uh, factor polynomials. So you you are given a quadratic digital character, let's say with modulus d, and then you define a polynomial sum of chi d and t to the n, and then the degree is like d. Uh, sorry, d minus one and chi d n is basically the character taking uh, chi, uh, character values. And an important feature here is chi d n itself is a multiplicative. And let me formulate the correction x by factor. So, so basically, he asks like, uh, how likely does a factor polynomial have no zeros in in zero one? Okay. Um, how likely, okay, you can, we can make it precise uh, in the classical way. So basically if you um, enumerate all the uh, character chi d with modules up to d, and then you consider those chi d such that um, the attack, the related uh, corresponding factor polynomial has no zeros in zero one. So that's the, the uh, 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 rigorous way to formulate this uh, being uh, how likely. Okay, so that's the question. Like, uh, try to understand this ratio. We denote this ratio by rho fd. And another very related question is called positive definite quadratic characters. So this is a positive definite, at least the definition we we borrowed it from the letter of Sanak. So we slightly twist his definition here. In this setting, we just say, we call a quadratic character chi d is positive definite. If you for any x, then the sum of chi d n from one up to x is always non-negative. So uh, we, we know that if you sum of chi d n, n from one up to let's say d, it will be zero. And then this question is really asking that um, we call a chi d is a positive definite is really saying that um, no matter where you stop, this partial sum is always um, stay at least will be non-active. And then very similarly, the correction you can ask uh, compared to the previous correction of uh, factor asked, uh, Polly asked the question that, uh, then what's the following density? So now you consider all the quadratic characters and enumerated by modulus up to capital D, and then consider how many of them has a property called positive definite, okay? So that's like uh, uh, another natural question you can ask. And it turns out these two questions are very connected. So 
let me briefly mention the connection between those questions. So, um, and also why at least one of the very original motivation for mathematicians to study this kind of properties of uh, quadratic characters because they are connected to zero zeros of uh, LS chi. So it turns out it's not difficult to prove that uh, chi d is positive definite would imply that the related uh, vector polynomial has no real zeros in this interval zero one. And also this will imply that the related L function LS chi d has no zeros in zero one. So in particular, this will give you that there's no single zeros. So now here's a dream. So if you can provide a way to uh, to show that, uh, for example, for a lot of chi d, it is indeed positive definite, then you can say that the related else chi d has no zero zeros. So this could be a way to rule out zero zeros, or at least it, it was a motivation. And uh, this implication, I will not mention the detail how to prove it, but I will mention um, a very similar um, uh, result along this line later give a proof. The proof is actually very simple. You're just busy using something called partial summation uh, or let's say integration by part. And, uh, and I just, I give you one of the key formula here, how to connect the second one to the third one, which is how to write L function in terms of, um, uh, the how the vector polynomial is involved. But anyway, um, these connections are not difficult to prove. So let me briefly mention the history of the, of the problems. So actually, at least if you check for small prime p, for example, then you consider the, the Legendre symbol or like chi p, then it's indeed positive for, in the sense of uh, we defined before, that is indeed positive for, for example, up to prime up to 33. So that's why like in 1911, so factor is he even like conjecture that actually for all prime P, then FPT or at least for large enough P, FPT has no zeros in zero one. And that's also, if it is, this dream is true, then basically uh, there's no zero zero for this, for the L function arising from this family. And then 1912, so Polly I proposed the question of studying these positive definite characters. And we also mentioned these two problems are very closely related. So, but after a couple of years, Polly himself, he proved that the actually factors conjecture is wrong. So because he found, he basically found that at least he can show that a positive proportion of character chi such that F chi t has a zero in zero one. So he can prove that he can find some for certain uh, proportion of uh, uh, character chi, this uh, factors conjecture is wrong. So, uh, and there's some, some interesting history here and obviously Chola and the Hebron, they didn't, uh, uh, they were not aware of this uh, history. So basically in 1930s, Chola suggested the question again and then the same question basically uh, as a factor's conjecture and here, here Brown disproved Charles' conjecture. So basically the history repeated a bit. Um, and the, the real first breakthrough here is around the 1990s. So Baker and Montgomery, they proved that actually the density uh, in both questions, like, as I just call it row D, uh, this kind of either factor polynomial has no zero or uh, the, the character chi being positive definite is a very rare event. This density will tend to zero. So this means that factors conjecture not only wrong, but also actually very, very wrong. It's almost opposite direction. Okay, so that's like uh, at least uh, up to 1990s, we know qualitative, qualitatively that uh, uh, rho d should be something tend to zero. Um, but we, uh, we are still want more. We want to know how, like, for example, like how fast rho d tend to zero. We want to give a, a much better understanding about, the, for example, the uh, the numerator. We know that numerator is small compared to the denominator, but how how large it is. We want to understand better. And then in in 
in 2021, so a couple of years ago, Kyle, Kyle Meaning, he gave a very nice, result. he proved a very nice result. So he gives the first quantitative bound. So he proved that this uh, um, quantity rho d will be uh, 10 to zero, but actually it's grows like uh, at most one over log log d to some power c. So density will be one over log log d to power c. And then I think in his paper, he kind of conjectured that he believed this is probably the crack shape. So basically he believed that this rho d will tend to zero roughly looks like one log log d tends to some, to some constants. And uh, I think based on my experience, after uh, when I give couple, some talks of, about this related results and people usually at the end of time would ask, well, how about the lower bounds? So I first, I will not tell you the answer. So the lower bounds, actually we know nothing, at least before my talk. Uh, uh, I believe after this talk, we will still know nothing. So basically, we don't know nothing about this law bound, unfortunately. So uh, unless you can prove something in the next half an hour, but otherwise, I, I believe we know nothing. And I also want to remark actually another uh, question. It's about sign change of factor polynomials. So it's busy asking about uh, how many times or how many zeros actually close to one along the rear axis. So uh, of a factor polynomial. So this is a very related question. So actually studied by a uh, re very recent result by Kluman, Lamzuri, and uh, Munch. So, and also actually there are two talks at the Namaste website along this line already. So you, if you want to know more about hi history and the progress along this line, you can watch the uh, videos. Um, okay. Now that's the background. So if you have any question, you can feel free to interrupt me. Uh, otherwise, so now I'm going to talk about, uh, uh, at least the first thing is how to make a guess, how we made a guess. And then hopefully you might want to agree with us. This is a correct guess. So I will guess just based on random models. So, okay. So we don't know how to prove, uh, how to find the correct answer, but let's first guess what is the answer. So suppose just is random. So we are considering the partial sum of uh, digital character, quadratic digital character. So basically quadratic digital character, the chi dn, well, it's roughly taking half, half of the time is taking plus one, half of the time taking next one. So let's just say if we replace chi dn by simply a random, purely random variable xn, if xn is independent, let's say, just because it make life easier and then taking values as one or negative one, then being positive definitely. So, okay, so for, for the rest of the talk, most of the time I just uh, focus on uh, positive definite uh, case. So it's the two questions, but they are more or less related. So I will focus on this uh, more intuitive uh, question and try to make a guess based on um, the privacy model. So, so let's just say to make it random and I replace the chi dm by xn and then so the density, okay, we might just really relate to the following probability. The probability is basically sum of xn uh, uh, being, being uh, non-negative for all x between one and uh, capital D, okay? So this is kind of a uh, probability version of this uh, being positive definite for quadratic characters. That's what we believe these two probabilities might be related. And now, okay, I already told you here in this line what's the probability is, but uh, suppose you believe this probability model, then you can you can guess this might be a very small chance, right? Because uh, if every time you either plus one or, or minus one, but how like how possible that you always stay above the x axis? So this is kind of the random walk, uh, people call it lazy random walk. How, how could it always be stay positive? So, so actually, if you have this kind of int intuition, then um, maybe when I told you what's the uh, factors conjecture, you probably believe the conjecture was wrong. Or you probably believe that uh, Baker and Montgomery's result probably is the correct answer. So the density should tend to zero. Or, or it's just like the probability here should be something very rare, should tend to zero. And from the probability literature, we know that uh, this is something called Ballard problem. And uh, the answer is roughly saying that the probability decay like one over square root D. So it's 10 to zero, actually 10 to zero quite fast. Okay. This is the first 
service model you probably come up with, and then you might believe that Baker and Montgomery result actually reasonable rather than the original conjecture um, being correct. So, so okay, that's a model, but uh, there's a significant difference here. So we assume all the XN is uh, in uh, sorry independent, but it's not the case for character values because character values a key property is it's a multiplicative. So chi d2 and chi d3, if you take them together, so chi d6 will be the product of chi d2 times chi d3. So, so this gives you a kind of feeling like uh, taking, assuming it's a completely independent, maybe it's a, it's a very rough, okay? So what do we do? Actually, you can slightly modify the uh, random model and uh, we take the multiple property into account so what do we do is the following. So we just first pull out the, the square part and the squares. So you can write any integer n as a square part like m square and times uh, square free part k. So if you write n as the k times m square, and then you can rewrite this sum of uh, chi n as sum of first pull out the square free part uh, k and then k m, k m square. Okay, then because km square is always one. K, sorry, chi m square is always uh, one because it's uh, multiplicative. So essentially all, all the value here in this in, in the sum is the same, same as chi k. And then you just need to count the multiplicity, like how many times chi k appear. So chi k appear roughly around square root x over k times, okay? And then, because, okay, so remember, we only care about sign changes. So we only care about basically this is positive or negative. So, so we don't care about this normalization square root k, for example. And we made some simplification here. So the sign, the sign of the above partial sum is roughly close to the sign uh, chi k over square root k. So we forget, we threw away these salient functions, uh, flow functions, and uh, we threw away this square root x because probably doesn't, uh, uh, it doesn't matter for the purpose, for our purpose, if we only care about the sign. So based on this heuristic and this guess, so probably this is the same as a chi k over square root k. So instead of original one, uh, just sum of chi n, now it's more like sum of chi k with certain weights. And these weights might be very important. And so, so actually using this multiplicative property and we're taking care of the square part, so we now um, maybe use a new probability model. So now we summing over x k over square root k, and now we want this to be always non-negative. Okay, this might be a, a more reasonable model. And then at this stage, we still we again we actually here we forget about the multiplicative property here. So basically, we assume it's independent, but at least now we we take the weights into account. And then uh, this one, you can compute the variance. So because basically the weight is one over square root K and the variance is basically something like sum of one over K. So sum of one over K for K up to uh, uh, capital D, it grows like uh, log D. So sum of one over K is a bit log D. So, so this probability from Ballard problem actually roughly looks at one over square root log D. So, with this modification, um, we our guess uh, original would probably the first guess is like one over square root d. Now the the modified guess it would be like one over square root log d. So move from d to log d by taking this this thing into account. Okay, this is all obviously this is all like previous guess. It's not sure, not true, not sure. Um, uh, it's not clear if it's correct or not, but. Uh, but anyway, we believe this heuristic and actually we run some numeric data. So the numeric seems that uh, uh, for both of the problem, the density indeed looks like uh, one over log D to the C. So if you, um, um, but, uh, and C is actually at least close to half. It's not very clear at the moment if C will be like literally half or very, very, very close, but at least some constant seems close to a half. And uh, so that's our guess. So, so our guess will be, and all our conjecture will be that for both of the corrections, either by 
either the zeros of factor polynomials or this correction about being positive definite, we believe both the density will be 10 to zero and it tends to zero roughly in the speed like uh, one over log due to some constant power. Okay, that's a guess. And uh, a previous slide based on some provision model suggests this also suggests this is the correct and numeric data seems also suggest this is the correct direction. And now what we can prove? And I remind you that actually in the previous result, Carl Liming, he conjectured that actually the correct answer might be one over log log d. But now since this uh, new heuristic contradicts his conjecture and numerical data also contradicts his conjecture. And this might be the correct conjecture. Um, so the theorem in progress, as I mentioned, hopefully this will be on archive this summer. So um, this, what we can prove is up bound is like uh, this row D is indeed for both of the corrections, row D will be at most one log D to some power. And uh, unfortunately, we cannot get our constant C uh, to be to be like very close to half, which is supposed to be the correct answer. And uh, there's some limitation in our method. So the best constant we can get will never be better than one over eight. Okay, I will mention why this is, uh, where is this limit limitation coming from? Um, but nevertheless, uh, we cannot do anything better than one over eight, but, uh, and also our constant is not too bad now. So in the end, probably um, we can get something like one over 40. So it's not too bad. It's not a tiny, tiny constant. It's some reasonable constant like one over 40, but um, it's basically, it depends on some uh, optimization kind of problem, but, uh, um, Okay, you will see that later at the end of the talk, you will see that no matter how hard we try, optimize it, we, we, our method cannot do anything better than one weight. So this question is still not fully solved, but, uh, if, but if you only care about the, uh, if it's log, one of log D or log log D, then I think at least for upper bound side, it seems uh, it's clear. Next. Okay. Max, sorry uh, to interrupt. Um, I think um, uh, Eunice Lamzuri would like to, to make a comment. Eunice, would, would you please unmute? Yeah, thank you very much. Sorry, Max, uh, just to clarify things. Uh, actually, uh, uh, from my work with uh, uh, Olexi and uh, Mark, uh, we mm -hmm. already disproved this conjecture of uh, Calmini. So we have a bound uh, for rho d, which is something like exponential of minus the constant log log d over triple log d. So we can't get okay, great. No, it's much weaker than what you have, but it's much stronger than one over uh, log log d to a power. Okay, just... great. Uh, that's that's uh, that's very good to hear. Yeah, sorry, I missed that result. Uh, but uh, I guess in your paper you proved quite many uh, nice results together. So I guess I missed this one. Like, great, thanks. Um, yeah. But, so then, uh, but wasn't, I shouldn't. Wasn't I shouldn't say as a. Sorry, wasn't Kalmini's conjecture only for primes before? Yeah, yeah, he only conjectured for prime. There are some lines yeah, in one. my talk. I see. The analogous one for, for, for these. I see. I see. Yeah. I see. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. then I should modify my slide. I should say a very close related question by you guys. Um, uh, okay, great. Good to know. So, yes, so calling is conjecture basically. Yeah, so it's, it's, it shouldn't be like one well, log log D anyway. Great. Um, but now what we suggest is it should be looks like one well, log D to some power. And at least for upper bound, this seems to be true. And we don't know how to uh, determine the, how, to, to get the constant like anything close to a half, but we can get something reasonable like 140. That's basically the main result. I want to present today. Uh, Max, sorry, before you uh, you continue, there is another question in the chat. Alexander, um, call me Nin, please. Um, would you unmute and ask away? Uh, yeah, so I wanted to ask uh, Yunus actually about uh, the result with one over log log log. Uh, is it unconditional or modular non-existence of Landau's equal zeros? Yeah. Okay, thank you, Alexander. It's a very good question. So in this uh, setting of uh, Max Schuh's talk, so for, for the family of fundamental discriminants, the result is, is unconditional. So it's uh, rho d is less than exponential. Oh, okay, thank you. Log over triple log. But for the primes, we need uh, we need the existence of Landau's equal zeros. Okay, 
the, to remove the existence, yes. Thank you very much, Alexander. Please continue. Okay, nice. great. Yeah, thanks for the question and comments. Pretty nice. Um, yeah, okay, that's like the main result. Now I want to probably move to um, uh, first the starting point. Um, the key observation here, so is the following, so which is quite simple, but uh, but um, very useful. So suppose KID is the positive definite, then you can you can observe that this uh, size of L half plus I T will be bounded by L half K D up to this factor. And uh, this is true for any T. So as a consequence, you might wonder why we do this step, but uh, okay, we'll see. So this maximum of uh, one T in an interval will be bounded by, for example, 10, 10 times L half K D. Okay, so you basically compare the local maximum of L function on the critical line uh, in certain short intervals and compare it to the um, center value, like a uh, half KID. Uh, how to prove this? This is very similar to the previous I mentioned, the con connections why uh, uh, being positive definitely imply, for example, uh, no zero zero stuff. So the proof is basically you're using just partial summation. There's nothing fancy here. So you write your LS KID in, in this way, and then, and then being positive definitely help you when you put absolute value everywhere, and then this this sum it because it's positive, or let's say non-negative, so there's no absolute sign here, and this value x to the s will come to the x to the sigma. So s so so sigma is the real part of s. So this quantity now looks basically like L sigma ID. And as you can see, uh, the, the same is not just the same thing is true not just for half line but for any sigma line. So this is basically the proof, and uh, this proved the first line. And second line is just uh, a trivial uh, consequence. And now uh, the thing would be, if chi D is something positive definite, then you can say that uh, the local maximum actually will be smaller than center value up to some constant. So the constant obviously is not important. So we want to find a contradiction of this. So basically, um, we want to show that actually the typical size of local maxima actually will be bigger than the center value. If that's true, then the beam positive definitely will be a very uh, rare property. It won't be satisfied for many KID. That's basically the idea. Okay, uh, just this is uh, what I write here. So the strategy will show that the typical local maxima is actually larger than typical center values. So if so, then beam positive definitely must be a rare event. And now slightly make it more fo uh, formal. So um, I just use the notation PD to denote the probability that we choose chi D uniformly from D. Okay, um, here's a good question. So also based on previous discussion of uh, Alexander and um, Eunice. And so, so uh, right now, at least in our write-up, we just for a family of chi D, um, not just focus on primes or, or, or uh, I think at least for primes, I think, uh, yeah. Uh, conditionally, it should be very easy to adapt our result. Unconditionally, you might to put, do some efforts, but uh, um, let, let me, in this talk, at least let me just focus on this uh, uh, for for general of a family of uh, conductors. And then then QD is the quantity I, I we will choose later. So it's basically QD is a measure of uh, how, what, what, what do we call it uh, being large or small? So let this first uh, density row one be this probability that L half chi D is bigger than this QD. Here probability is a uniform random choosing of chi D from a family. So row two be the probability that uh, the local maximum actually is smaller than QD. Uh, QD is something to be D later. And then the quantity we care about must satisfy that this row D density will be Smaller than row one plus row two, because otherwise, if uh, if uh, both of them fail, these two events fail, you will see that QD will be bigger than L half chi D, and uh, but smaller than local maximum, and then this will contradict to the previous assumption, the consequence of previous assumption. So, if you are positive definite, then you must line this uh, union, and then so so then the strategy would be just we want to find a suitable QD such that you can minimize the sum of the two. 
So this is here's a trade off. Of course, if you make a, a QD extremely large, then row one should be very 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 small because um, this just possibly could be zero. But the point is here, like uh, you want to minimize the sum of two. So you want to find a suitable QD such that both of them are small. And in particular, if you look at row one, uh, sorry, row one, row two, it's basically you want to understand something called local, local maximum of this uh, L value on the uh, critical line. So, okay, so that's like uh, roughly the uh, difficulty we need to, like two tasks we need to understand. One is about the kind of the typical size of uh, hub ID. One is about local maximum size, typical local maximum size. And uh, for uh, good news is, for at least one of them is kind of clear. Yes, we have some good results already established by um, heap, raspberry, and sound, and also later in the in the case of uh, zeta functions and uh, uh, gao zhao uh, uh, is. Ma uh, meant to make this L function version uh, explicit, let's say. So this is well understood. And uh, we have a good understanding of the at least the average size. And this point here is like, we actually will apply this moments bound, not for integer K, but for fractional, uh, for fractional, uh, for, for the fraction moment K. So in the end, if you care about it, we'll apply this to, apply this uh, in the case K equals a half. So, and now if you know this kind of a certain average of uh, uh, L values, center values, and of course you can use the Markov's inequality to get some upbound on this L half KD being exceptionally large. Exceptionally large means bigger than QD. But of course, at this moment, as I remarked in the previous slide, there is a game we need to play. So it's not clear yet which QD we should uh, use but we will see later. So, but nevertheless, the strategy is clear here. On this side, at least we, on the center values, we just apply this uh, fractional moment bounds and uh, for certain QD using Markov inequality, we at least can get certain uh, control on the exceptional probabilities. And we will see later which QD we will use based on our understanding about local maxima of uh, uh, our values on the critical lines in a short intervals. Okay, so now, our result now boils down to understanding the distributional behavior of local maximum. Again, here, when I say distributional behavior, I mean this chi d, this little d is chosen from a family. So that's the only randomness coming from, and the rest is basically considering the maximum, local maximum t in a certain interval. The exact length of the interval is not very important. But I just put it to one, two. And now we want to understand this maximum. How, how, what's the typical size of this max? And uh, this seems to be a challenge question, at least, because suppose you, you didn't, you haven't studied anything along this line before, because um, you are taking the maximum of a union of, uh, let's say, a family of L values. It, it seems unclear how to proceed. But for fixed T, maybe you know something. If you heard about certain, like, several essential limit theorem, you maybe have some guess about uh, the typical size of for single T. But this kind of question is uh, challenging because now you need to consider max over a family of t. And then for different t, obviously, for example, there are two t's that are very close to each other. You might expect there are a lot of correlations, correlations and then it's unclear how this local maximum would look like. Okay, that's roughly your first, um, maybe your first in, uh, reaction about this question. Um, but thanks to very, Quite, quite several recent development on this uh, thing called Fedora Hyari Kitting Injection, I will introduce in a bit, in a minute. And um, actually we have some strategy to understand quants like this. So that's a good thing. Um, let me just very briefly mention the Fedora Hyari Kitting Conjecture. So at least in the zeta functions, urban zeta function case, so Fedora Hyari Kitting Injection roughly say the following story. So um, as I mentioned already in the previous slides, um, there's something called Cerebral Essential Limit Theorem. So maybe I should first tell you what is Cerebral Essential Limit Theorem. So basically, um, if you fix a T, let's forget the max here, you just fix a T, and then the log of theta half plus IH, this one looks basically like Gaussian. So it behaves like Gaussian, in a sense like a, when you're choosing uniformly random H from a big interval. This value will looks like Gaussian with certain mean and uh, virus. And now 
Fidori Kiari Keating and Jackie is talking about. So now instead of looking just a single value, I still let my H running from a very big interval, but uh, I only I consider the local maximum. Local, for example, can be any some some interval of bounded length. Let's just say one or two. So that's basically talking about how large is this max. So you you the randomness is still coming from this H. H is running from a big interval, but uh, you look at the not a single point value, but uh, you look at the small neighborhood around that random point, and you want to understand that value. And this FHK conjecture basically pre make a very uh, amazing prediction. So it not only predict the first term log log H, and also predict something the second order term. Um, and as I mentioned, there for different t, the zeta values have correlation with each other. So it's kind of a challenging question. And um, if you naively, let's say, forget about all the, uh, forget about a certain level of uh, dependency, actually there's a st nice story here. This uh, three quarters should be one quarters. So this uh, assumption, so this conjecture really adapts a lot of uh, dependency structure. So it's quite uh, remarkable, and it's basically now solved by Agreen, Bogard, and Roswell. Um, nevertheless, this, this is something we know along this line um, about log zeta. And now what, uh, what we care about, if you remind you, we care about local maximum, but we can care about L half plus IT of chi D. And, um, and uh, why these two are connected? So. Let's see the randomness. So uh, the randomness here in FHK is H running from certain big interval. But here we don't have H, we just have a T. And we have, but we have chi D. So how to make that connection? That's probably the key. Okay, so suppose you are expert working on FHK conjecture before, and after this slide, you, maybe you can leave now. Um, but uh, let me just uh, tell you the comparison and maybe you can, uh, realize uh, this is indeed doable correction. So the comparison is actually just simple. So suppose um, I have chi d, I write it naively just as chi d n divided by n to half plus i t, and I compare it to the log zeta. So, sorry, the zeta function, zeta is a function, zeta half plus i h plus i t, I write it as one over n to the half plus i t plus i h. And now to make it even more similar, I can write to the n to the i h to the numerator and to the negative i h and then into the half plus i t. Okay, so now if you look at the two expressions, the denominator is completely same and t is both in a short interval and I even make the same short intervals. And now, now the we have a quadratic character chi d n, which is a resource of randomness. And uh, in zeta case, it basically just also a character into the negative i h. And our parameter little d go up to capital D. And then their parameter little h go to capital H. So all the rest looks very similar. So so if you so basically this is randomness. And uh, and you might believe that if we want to adapt to the previous previous people's work, um if you don't really have a kidding conjecture, we might be establish an L function version of this uh, our our version of uh, um F -K conjecture and then that might be enough. Okay, so and uh, this log log h as you can see here might be exactly the, the, the cutoff log of QD we want to find, so which might be log log D. But that's also remind you we have some slightly different focus. So in our case, if you still remember our goal, our goal is to say that uh, this uh, in positive definite is an uh, exceptional property. So the probability is ex exceptional probability to be to let to have positive definite probability uh, property. So we really want to quantify this uh, thing called probability 10 to one, which is here. So it is probability 10 to one this thing we want to quantify it because this is exactly the prob exceptional probability we want to have as our upper bound while the slightly different uh, focus for most of people previous people's results when they want to prove the fhk conjecture one very attractive thing is to uh, to to achieve the second order term 
because for the second order term, you can also see some different, like um, really interesting phenomena here as a, like a three quarter phenomena here. So uh, they maybe care more about the pre how precisely you can prove the local maximum, the typical size of local maximum. But they maybe, but for that purpose, uh, they may not care that much about in the range we care about, let's say, um, how fast this probably tend to one. So there's some, some, at least from technical aspect, there's some dif different focus. Nevertheless, there's a, this is a connection. So if you believe this connection makes sense and you probably believe that uh, this, the version of uh, uh, FHC conjecture for that we need can be established by some similar idea strategies. Although the technical difficulty probably very different, but the uh, whole strategy might go through. So that's kind of the heuristic for, for the, um, behind the strategy and why the, the where the confidence come from okay now um so this is the result we can prove so again let d to be a, in a certain family try to be big here and then we can prove that the local maximum uh if it's a small small and log d this is the qd basically then this probability will be bounded by log d to some power okay and now i remind you again on the other side, which is the fraction moment part, you can use a Markov inequality to get that if the probability L, the probability L have chi D bigger than this QD, actually is very small. It's, this bound is a one over eight, you see. Okay, that's a reminder you at the very beginning of my talk, I mentioned that there's some limitation of our method because using this method, you can never beat one eight because of this. Okay, and this constant C, is some reasonable constant. So this up to, up to this slide, we have I have shown you that our proof strategy and what's the main input. And uh, uh, yeah, let's just combine these two things together. We get the, the up one we need. And now in the rest roughly seven minutes, uh, I will give you some, some heuristic, at least uh, how this local maximum is proved. And um, especially if you haven't seen some result about FHK uh, before, I think it's a good thing to do. So I will only I remind you the heuristics, so I was um, maybe in two slides. So for a fixed T, we expect this log of half plus I T chi D, for example, just naively, as, so okay, in this slide, there are probably a lot, a lot of mistake, not a rigorous part, but I just want to pursue you why it's like kind of makes sense or correct. Like what's intuition behind this. So we just write it as a, certain digital polynomials. And then P to the IT is basically cosine T log P. So this is like chi DP times something deterministic, but there's T involved. And then if we assume this chi DP now, just a random, again, it's just truly random independent coin flip random variable, just take one or negative one half half probability, independent everywhere. Then this will suggest this partial sum it's basically the same as probably like XP cosine T log P divided by square root P. And now this one is basic Gaussian because if it's indeed independent, then you can compute some mean and virus. Okay, for any fixed T, you know this sum is not very scary. Okay, that's the heuristic. But now for different, different uh, two Ts, uh, you still now you can consider the virus. So this is this quantity we consider at T1 and we consider at T2. And then you can compute the covariance. Actually, you can also, this is basically looks at log of something, the log of one over the difference between T1 and T2. And this is the thing in the provincial literature is something called log correlation structure. So they have some nice tools or understanding about how to understand local maximum of this kind of uh, log correlation structure. And now I make this a little bit more precise. So. Uh, re uh, recall that the previous question we really want to study now is the typical size of this max sum of xp cosine t log p divided by square root p. And then if we denote this quantity by zt, this big z of th this kind of max. So, and just look at this uh, definition. If t1 and t2 are extremely close, zt doesn't change much. You just look at it, t log p. So p is up to d. So if d, if t, is smaller than one over log D, then this is basically always the same. 
then the, re, the, the, the VT should be just the same as Z0, Z let's say. So that's why uh, we, uh, we have this observation. So that means we can do some discretization. So if we expect, if we just uh, uh, split the interval to equal distributed point, t, sampling point T1, T2, up to TL, and if all the difference distance around the TIs is roughly one of log D, then we roughly have something like log D sampling points. Then the max over this continuous interval probably roughly the same as the max over all uh, Gaussian random variables. And recall each one is indeed Gaussian and uh, we know their log correlated, correlated structure. And turns out this amount of uh, information is already enough to determine the typical size of the local maximum. So you know single point distribution and you know the log correlated structure. So it basically two point, two point wise uh, correlation is enough. So that's the process heuristic, why it's correct. And uh, up to this point, you should, for number theory, you should probably believe that if you can make all this uh, uh, connection rigorous, and then probably there are the probabilities, there are certainly probabilities literature like studies, this kind of natural correction was the typical size of local maximum. Okay, the several, so this is just one kind of philosophy uh, uh, summary. So there's two stages. The first stage is you want to uh, translate this uh, local maximum of L function to this uh, um, um, local maximum of certain digital polynomial. This step is more or less kind of uh, have been studied many, many times in different contexts for number series. But then the second stage is probably really a probability correction. Okay, I skip this couple of lines because this couple of lines has more um, um, details. But I just want to remind you, if you want to know more about FHK, at least just in this same number theory web seminar, uh, Razvia uh, gave a talk a couple of years ago. Um, so I will skip this part. And I want to mention this thing is related to the, something called branch and random works uh, literature in probability. Um, now, I actually, this is a bonus. I have two minutes, so I think. There's something I think very interesting. Um, and probably a little bit misleading results if you consider. So, okay, here's the results. So the results following. So we talk about being positive definite. So here's another version of being positive definite. So, so let F be a sample of a random completely multi-function. So random just means a certain family of uh, multi-function. You can see all multi-function because the multi-function is determined by F2, F3, F5, F7, for example. So then certainly up to some point, you have a family of uh, completely multiple function, and then you just randomly choose one of them, let's say. We call F is a positive definite if, again, this thing is non-active. But now we have a certain weights, one over N. And then we want to understand how likely uh, F, a random chosen F, this is positive definite. But it's actually quite surprising with this version, like you have this weights one over N, being positive definite is something very, very likely. The probability is something like 0 0.99999, but it's actually also strictly smaller than one. So it's something, uh, absolute constant is smaller than one, but it's extremely close to one. And remind you in our setting, the, the main, uh, main topic of this talk, being positive definite is something very rare. And that's kind of uh, something funny and different. And, and if you care about why people originally care about this, this version of being positive definite, the motivation is not about uh, legal zeros, but probably something related to Riemann hypothesis. So Turan observed that for F, if F, if you choose F to be Liouville function, and if you Liouville function pass through the test, being positive all the time, then you prove the IH. And uh, very recent, not that recent, okay. But I listen, after a while, then people observe that with the help of computer, the function unfortunately didn't pass through the test. So at some point, a very huge X Lua function being negative for the first time. So Lua function is an exceptional case. How exceptional in this sense? So um, that's a very funny problem. And you can also ask about something like asymptotic behavior, like how likely this is being positive. Um, and Rodrigo and I also had some results on this slide, and this was also uh, very recently improved by um, Alexi and uh, uh, Kerr, 
Bruska, I think. Um, yeah, I think, I think, okay, I just run out of time. So uh, I, I recently finished my PhD and I actually really want to thank for the organizers. So uh, I studied my PhD in pandemic. So I think uh, it's both graduate students and also a lot of junior fa uh, faculty or like uh, postdocs. I think uh, communication is in mathematics is very important, but when you are very junior, you don't have enough friends or, or collaborators. And I think this um, amazing web seminar is really helpful to pr provide this platform for for um, for number theory to talk with each other, to listen to great talks, and uh, uh, yeah, especially during the pandemic times. And I, I see I, I check the website. I think it's already almost four years. It's more than four years actually. Um, I'm, so it's really covered almost all of my PhD. So I really uh, thank the three organizers. Uh, Michael, Philip, and Alina. Um, yeah, so again, thank you for all the audience coming to my talk. Yeah, I'm happy to take any questions.